Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Dr. Khalil Salim speaking. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to see our lecture. This is a, a lecture upon a kind request from uh, Dr. Susan uh, Rattal in Al-Kindi University. في أحد الأيام كان أم العبد وأبو العبد جالسين مع بعضهم البعض فقالت أم العبد يا ريت ربنا يرزقنا الطفل الحلو وجميل وأبو العبد قال لك يلا عليهم أنا جاهز وأبنا رزقهم بعلم قل فسبحان الله the creation of Ali didn't come all of a sudden it came through stages so the first stage was fertilization where a zygote is formed by the fusion of both an ovum and a sperm after that, the cell starts to divide. We have the two cell stage, four cell stage, eight cell stage, and then we have the moriola stage. After that, the moriola will leach itself to the endometrium to start to form the embryo. At day 16, a small embryonal disc can be recognized, and the, the, this is formed of two cell layers, epiblast and the hypoblast. The epiblast will form the future ectoderm, and the, the hypoblast will form the uh, endoderm. And these are actually sandwiched between two cavities. We have the amniotic cavity and the uh, yolk sac. Afterwards, around 17 days, a small structure will start to drill between the two layers, the hypoblast and the epiblast. This is called the notochord. The notochord will cause activation of both epiblast and the hypoblast to form the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And the ectoderm will start also to differentiate into surface ectoderm and neuroectoderm as well. Surface ectoderm overlying the notochord will start to groove in to form the neuroectoderm. And this will start as the neural groove, which will close centrally, and then it will zip uh, cranially before caudally by two days. So at 26 days, the neural tube is closed cranially, and at, and at 28 days, it will close caudally. Defect of closure will form neural tubular defect. So at day 23, small to primordial eyes will start to form. This is called the optic pit. The optic pit at the cranial part of the neural tube will form an optic vesicle. This will further invaginate to form an optic cup. As the optic cup is invaginating, it will activate the overlying surface ectoderm, forming a lens pit and a lens vesicle, which will be engulfed inside the primordial cup or the optic cup. Now, the optic cup has two layers. We have an outer layer and an inner layer. The outer layer will form the retinal pigment epithelium, while the outer layer will form the neurosensory retina. This is a very important piece of information as it will give you insight on the pathology of retinal detachment. Just a quick insight on the lens embryology. The lens placode will be engulfed inside the optic cup and it will start to get its blood supply from the anterior and posterior tunica vascularis These blood vessels will regress with time, and they will disappear as the lens is deemed to have to be to become acellular. It will become just a bag filled with proteins, and it retains its cytoskeleton along with a capsule which is covering up these proteins. The lens has three proteins. These are called the alpha crystalline and beta gamma crystallines, and these are heat shock proteins or chaperones. They uh, they maintain and preserve the cytoskeleton. They maintain the protein, preventing denaturation of the protein, as we will see in the upcoming lecture. As we have taken the basic embryology, now we will talk about and anatomy of the anterior segment, cornea and lens, sclera, uh, anatomy of the uvea, and finally, anatomy of the retina. The cornea and the sclera forms the fibrous layer of the eye. 
followed by the vascular layer, which is the ciliary body along with the choroid. And finally, we have the neural layer, which is the retina along with the endothelium covering the um, ciliary body. The transparent part of the fibrous layer is called the cornea. It has a power of 43 to 44 diopters and a horizontal diameter of around 11.5 to 12 millimeter. The vertical diameter is less than the horizontal by one millimeter. The power of the cornea is more in the center of the cornea and less in the peripheral. This is called the aspheric cornea. And it has a um, the advantage of decreasing the optical aberrations. Histologically, the cornea is formed of five layers. We have the epithelium, which is the only regenerative layer, followed by the Bowman's layer, which is the acellular layer of the stroma. The stroma, which, for, which has keratocytes and collagen. And finally, we have the dismiss membrane, which is the basement membrane of the endothelium. And finally, we have the endothelial cells. These endothelial cells play an important role in maintaining the uh, compactness of the stroma. The histology of the cornea starts from the epithelium. The epithelium uh, is, a, is around four to six layer thickness. The basement layer, which is the deepest layer, is the only regenerative layer. And then these cells, they become more and more flattened as they go to the surface. The, uh, these cells are bound together by tight junction so that they do not allow fluid from the tear film to enter into the stroma. Um, this will help optimal hydration of the stroma and it will prevent uh, stromal edema. Uh, another important thing is that we have a basement membrane. This basement membrane is only found at the basal layer. At the basal layer, the, more, the, the, uh, deepest, the deepest layer. Two clinical applications of what we learned. The first, for example, in the case of a corneal abrasion, the epithelium uh, regenerates very fast within the first week and usually it closes the defect, but full thickness doesn't go there until five to six weeks until full thickness uh, of the epithelium go back, goes back to normal. Another application is that the tear film is the only and most important refractive surface of the eye. If you don't have a stable tear film, unfortunately, this will cause overscattering of light because the epithelium or the surface of the epithelium is very irregular. So if there is no tear film, adequate tear film to close or let's say homogenize the surface of the eye, the patient will start to feel that uh, there is blurring of vision uh, along with the redness and grittiness that happens with dryness of the eye. The second layer is the stroma. The stroma consists of around 85% of the corneal thickness. It has two important layers. We have the Bowman's layer, which is the acellular part of the stroma. And we have the cellular part, which is the stroma proper, that contains keratocytes uh, and collagen type 1. The collagen fibers are always parallel to each other and they are compact in a way uh, in order to minimize the scattering of light. If the, um, there is haphazard deposition of the collagen or uh, there is corneal edema, which is fluid between the corneal um, bands or let's say the collagen bands, then the, you'll have a lot of scattering of light and this will cause uh, the uh, the cornea to become opaque. Nerve bundles supply the stroma from the trigeminal nerve. Uh, usually it comes from the periphery at 9 and 3 o'clock and then it forms circles. We have deep nerval arcs and then superficial nerval arcs which are found in the stroma of the cornea. The endothelium is monocellular layer of cuboidal cells that are bound together by tight junctions. These cells are very important in play, uh, and play a role in the optimal hydration of the cornea. They actively pump water out of the stroma uh, to the uh, inside of the eye or the anterior chamber. 
and uh, any decrease in the cell count in these cells will jeopardize this function and it will cause corneal edema or fluid inside the stroma which will cause opacity of the cornea the these cells are attached uh, to the stroma by the basement membrane called Desmade's membrane. The endothelial count is highest at birth and it should be maintained between three to 4,000 cells per uh, millimeter square. But it will decrease with time as the patient age and there will be cell loss. Uh, if the cell count goes below uh, 1500 cells per millimeter square then the cornea will start to become edematous this information is very important especially before doing corneal grafts a corneal graft should have at least 3000 cells per millimeter square before implanting it in a patient uh, otherwise, uh, the half-life of that corneal graft will be low. It is very important to note that endothelial cells do not regenerate. They respond to stress by hypertrophy only. And the uh, size of the cell increase and the function also increase till a, cert a certain limit. After afterwards, they decompensate. Now we will be talking about aqueous outflow. The aqueous is produced by the processes of the ciliary body, specifically the non-pigmented epithelial cells. Afterwards, this will travel to, to the posterior chamber, through the pupil to the anterior chamber. And from there, it will be filtered to the trabecular meshwork out to the episcleral veins. The aqueous flow has many important functions. The first one, which is maintaining the dimensions of the eye by maintaining adequate intraocular pressure, which is between 9 and 21 millimeter mercury. The other important function is nourishment to the endothelial cells and the lens. Because these structures are avascular, they need nourishment from the uh, aqueous, which baths. Uh, the cells of the cornea and the lens at the same time. There are two important pathways through which the aqueous filters out of the eye. The first one, which is the conventional pathway, this is called the uh, or the trabecular meshwork, and the other one, which is the unconventional pathway or the uveoscleral pathway. The conventional pathway of filtration is called the trabecular meshwork. This has the three important layers juxtacanalicular, which gives <clears throat> the largest resistance, followed by corneal scleral, and finally the uveal part of the trabecular meshwork. And from there, the aqueous will be filtered into a circular canal. Uh, it's co uh, called the Schlimm's canal. From there, small collector channels will take the aqueous, and this will be filtered into the episcleral veins. The lens is the second refractive surface of the eye. Uh, it has around 17 to 20 diopteric power, and it is suspended by le the lens zonules, and they are, these lens zonules attach the lens to the ciliary body. The lens has the ability to accommodate. Whenever the patient is looking at a near object, these, uh, the ciliary body will contract and this will cause a slackening of the of the zonules and the anthropocyte diameter of the lens will increase by that the power of the lens will increase and this will allow the light uh, to be focused on the retina accommodation is age dependent we are all born with a high accommodative reserve which can reach up to 20 diopters. However, this decreases with age. So at 20 years, you have around 10 diopters. And at 40 years, you have six diopters. And at 60 years, you have zero diopters. It is thought that the rigidity 
of the lens accounts for the loss of accommodation and it is not as as um, as was thought in the in the previous days that the ciliary body might uh, be compromised due to the aging process the lens is devoid of blood vessels and uh, it has an oblate shape and it has lost all its um, uh, cells um, what you see is just proteins called, called crystallins and uh, the fibers which constitute the cytoskeleton of the lens the lens has three important parts we have a nucleus in the center of the lens and then you have a cortex and this is encapsulated uh, via a capsule the capsule is formed of elastin uh, the capsule is very important as it separates the contents of the lens from the eye. The capsule is thickest anteriorly and it is thinnest posteriorly. The lens mass increases with age. At birth, it's around 65 milligrams. However, there is a, a large jump in the first year of life to reach around 125 milligrams. And then it continue to add more fibers as the patient age un, uh, until death. So at around 90 years of age, the lens can reach a mass of 260 milligrams. New fibers are added from the equatorial region. This explains how um, biologically you can know the age of the person from the lens mass. The choroid is the vascular layer of the eye. It, ha it is composed of three parts. We have the small vessel layer, large vessel layer, and the choriocapillaris. The function of the choroid is to nourish the outer one third of the eye. It has other important functions that pamper and help the photoreceptor to function normally. One of them is heat regulation. You know, the photoreceptors are subjected to high temperatures. This is because the light which hits the retina, part of it is converted into heat. And it's the choroid function that has the melanin to absorb uh, most of the heat. And because of the high flow circulation, which is found in the choroid, most of the heat will be dissipated the blood supply of the choroid comes from the long and short posterior ciliary arteries. These are blood, these are blood vessels uh, that originate from the ophthalmic artery. The retina is the nervous layer of the eye. It has the ability to change electromagnetic waves, which is light, into electricity, meaningful electricity that can be interpreted by the brain. The retina has three important functional layers. The first layer, which is the photoreceptors. These are the rods and cones, followed by the first order neuron, or what we call the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells collect electricity from the photoreceptors to the ganglion cells, which are the second order neurons. The photoreceptors has important two types. We have the rods and the cones. Collectively, the rods and cones are around 125 million cells. So we have 5 million cones and we have 120 million rods. So the cones are found in the center uh, of, the, uh, of the retina, an area called the fovea. Um, this is the most important part of the retina that can see uh, colors. It has the best visual acuity and uh, it has the ability to see static images, unmoving images. Unlike the rods, which are found at the periphery of the retina, it has the ability to detect movement and uh, it doesn't see colors. It, uh, it only appreciate white and black images.
the photoreceptors receive their blood supply from the choroid. The choroid filters most of the blood, or let's say most of the contents in the blood, of the blood. And then it is the job of the uh, retinal pigment epithelium, these are around 6 million cells, that filter a specific concentration of materials that are used by the photoreceptors. For example, uh, photoreceptors need um, high concentration of vitamin A. Uh, the, they are very sensitive to toxic materials, for example, penicillin, uh, other materials like lipids and proteins. That's why it's very important to selectively uh, allow specific materials to enter into the matrix that bath those cells. And on the other hand, waste products should be dealt with Every morning, 100 disc is shed from every photoreceptor into the matrix of the retina. This is taken by and dealt with by the retinal pigment epithelium, which recycle up all the good materials back into the photoreceptor and take the waste products out to the circulation. At the fovea, there is a one-to-one -one connection, which means one photoreceptor will convey to one bipolar cell and one bipolar cell will connect to one ganglion cell. However, in the periphery, connection is dealt with by something called temporal summation, means that many photoreceptors, many rods, will convey a signal to one bipolar cell and, one, and many bipolar cells will convey the signal to one ganglion cell. The ganglion cells are the second order neurons. They collect all the information which comes from the retina. And uh, after that, their axons will exit the cells and they will converge all to form the optic nerve. And uh, the optic nerve is called the blind spot of the retina because there, are, there is no uh, visual field at that area, or no, let's say, uh, photoreceptors at that area. So uh, this area is blind. Um, but most of us do not appreciate it because we, uh, we have two eyes, and uh, one visual field will obscure the, the other's eye blind spot. That's why we don't see it. Now we will talk about few clinical applications that has to do with anatomy. The most important that comes in mind is retinal detachment. Retinal detachment is caused by the, se the embryonal separation of the outer and inner layer of the cup. And we have said that the outer layer of the cup will form the retinal pigment epithelium and the inner cup will form all the neurosensory retina. So there is a potential space that God has created between the outer and the inner layer of the cup. Uh, this potential space might uh, end up with detachment or let's say separation of those two layers. So uh, in summary, retinal detachment is the separation of the neurosensory layer and the retinal pigment epithelium. For simplicity, retinal detachment can be classified into regmatogenous retinal detachment, which is retinal detachment caused by a retinal hole or non-regmatogenous retinal detachment. These can be further classified into tractional retinal detachment and exudative retinal detachment. Talking about regmatogenous retinal detachment, this is retinal detachment caused by a peripheral retinal hole. This might happen secondary to trauma, diseases of the periphery that might be congenital, or the presence of high myopia. Vitreous detachment, which is the separation of the vitreous gel from the retina, is a very important predisposing factor for this type of retinal detachment. Patient might present with flashes of light, uh, sudden visual loss, which is characterized by the presence of a curtain, a black curtain that obscure the visual field. Most of the time, the repair of this retinal detachment is surgical. Usually, we do vitrectomy, which is a remove. Uh, this is a procedure in which we remove the adhesions and we remove the uh, vitreous body. And then the vitreous cavity 
after repair of the retina is filled either with uh, gas or silicone oil. Success of surgery is highly dependent on the extent of the hole, the type, and uh, the pathology that caused the retinal detachment, and the uh, presentation. If the patient presents early within the first week, the success of surgery is much higher than presenting later on. The other cause is called tractional retinal detachment. Tractional retinal detachment is caused by diabetic retinopathy in most of the time or inflammation of the eye that causes adhesion between uh, or let's say adhesion within the vitreous. These adhesions will pull up the retina and uh, it will cause a separation of the neurosensory retina from the retinal pigment epithelium. Tractional retinal detachment can be named funnel shaped retinal detachment because uh, it's different in architecture if you compare it to the dome shape retinal detachment or the rigmatogenous retinal detachment. It has this funnel shape or um, because of the negative pressure uh, done by the retinal pigment epithelium and the vitreous pull from the other side uh, caused by the adhesions in the vitreous. The final type is exudative retinal detachment. This is caused by overfiltration of a fluid and exudates from the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, there are some important diseases that can cause this. The first is uveitis. Others like tumors, retinoblastoma or malignant melanoma. This is a dome-shaped detachment. The uh, treatment is by treating the underlying cause. For example, if we are dealing with a tumor, then it's very important to treat that tumor. If we are dealing with uveitis or any inflammatory condition, you target your treatment towards the inflammation. Surgery might worsen exudative retinal detachment. That's why diagnosis is very crucial. And thank you so much.